Good evening and a very warm welcome to everyone joining us both at HFW Geneva and remotely. We are delighted to be back in Switzerland uh, for our second international event with the Swiss market kindly hosted by HFW Geneva. And before we begin, I need to say a few thank yous. First of all, to Michael and the HFW Geneva and all the team for providing a venue, refreshment for those attending in person, for hosting the hybrid technology so we can join from afar and for all their help and support in coordinating the event, the speakers and the logistics. And also thank you to all the speakers, your generosity in giving your time, effort and experience makes this educational event possible. And it's certainly vital for the YNP and greatly appreciated. So thank you. So let me introduce our panelists for today. Uh, Michael Busset of HFW probably needs no introduction. He's head of HFW Geneva office we, where he relocated in 2015. He has worked in London, Singapore and Geneva. He's a native French and German speaker and practices in English, French and German. He's a qualified English solicitor and a French avocat. He specializes in litigation, arbitration, commercial contract with an emphasis on commodities and shipping. Richard um, Keguin of Totsa Total qualified as a barrister in 1996 and requalified as a solicitor in 1999. He moved from London to Geneva in 2007 to join Total Energy's trading and shipping legal department. He has also been a member of the Okim uh, Legal Committee since 2007 and chaired th that committee between 2012 and 2016. And our third speaker is Martin Kelly of Kofco. Uh, Martin trained as a lawyer in shipping and international trade. Following an early career as a naval officer, Martin has more than 25 years experience in the commodities industry, covering all legal aspects of the business, initially in private practice and then in-house with ExxonMobil, Noble Group Limited and Kofco International as a deputy GC since 2017. He also acts as an arbitrator under GAFTA and FOSFA rules. Herman Sherlin, um, who is uh, also in the panel, is an associate with HFW Geneva. She joined HFW in January 2022, having qualified at another firm the year before. She specializes in international litigation, arbitration, with a particular emphasis on commodities and shipping. But she's also worked on sanctions and regulatory, regulatory matters. And finally, uh, Felix Neri of Schifferly Associé is a Swiss lawyer practicing in Geneva. He was admitted to the Swiss Bar in 2013 and is a member of the Geneva Bar Association, the Swiss Arbitration Association and the British Swiss Chamber of Commerce. Now, let me give you just some uh, very quick information about today's format. So Michael will moderate and chair the session and give a brief introduction on the topic of force majeure. Uh, Martin will then give his perspective from a soft trading house um, and then Richard will then speak, uh, giving his perspective from an all major side. Uh, this will then be followed by uh, input from an English law perspective from er both Hermans and Michael. And then we will hear the Swiss angle from Felix. Uh, and finally, we will have about 20, 30 minutes for questions from the audience where we invite everyone to participate. And during the session, people joining remotely uh, can drive the question in the Q&A so that the question can be picked up um, at the end of the session. So without a further ado, I will hand over to Michael to kick off today's session. Thank you, Michael. Thank you very much, <laughs> Francesca, for the very kind introduction. Hi, a warm welcome to everyone to this YMP HFW seminar webinar. It's a hybrid event. It's a bit of a first for us here in Geneva, but we are very much delighted to um, have, and we're very privileged to have a number of guest speakers with us here in the office um, this afternoon who are very experienced in the industry and we have an in interesting uh, perspective from the oil industry. We hear from Richard Kegwin, um, on the oil side, um, and we'll hear from Martin Kelly at Kofco on the soft side and the grain industry focus. So we really have a mix 
of force majeure topics. And we hear from the people in the industry who are looking at those issues um, on the front line on a daily basis. And we also have um, uh, uh, a comment from the private practitioners in the field here with Felix Newey um, in Switzerland, giving us an insight on how the Swiss um, look at it uh, here in, in Geneva. And um, we'll be surprised um, to hear that it's, it's quite different um, how the English um, jurisdiction looks at it and how the Swiss are looking at those issues. I will just say a few words to set the scene and how we came up with um, Poker FM, a powerful tool in a volatile market, other, other question. In the last um, couple of years, the early 2020s have seen huge disruption in commodity flows and markets. Some say it was unprecedented. We had the pandemic and the various lockdowns that have um, basically put uh, the economy to a halt for a number of months. Oil prices fell to rock bottom at some stage. Um, then we had the Russian invasion of Ukraine, which has also turned the world as we knew it upside down, certainly in terms of the grain trade and then also in the oil trade with sanctions issues, huge volatility in markets, trade flows being re reinvented and rechanneled. And those two major events have meant huge volatility, uncertainty in the markets, which has really been uh, the highlight of um, the last two years. And this volatility has led to a flood of contract terminations, either because there was a legitimate inability to perform a contract, but also, as we have seen, a number of players using um, FM and force majeure as an opportunistic tool to get out of a contract, sometimes successfully, sometimes less successfully. And we'll, we'll kind of touch on that uh, on this journey today together um, with Richard Martin and Felix and Amos. Um, and we'll highlight the importance of a well-drafted force majeure clause and uh, also how important it is to gather the evidence um, once you try to apply the events to the terms of the clause. Now, force majeure, it's a, it comes from the French, it means superior force, and it's a common clause we see in all sorts of contracts, shipping contracts, sale contracts, um, and others, which limits the liability of a party in a given circumstance uh, when the party is prevented or hindered from performing. And on the occurrence of certain events, um, FM can excuse performance for a period of time. And often it does that in the first instance, and then it can allow a party relying on the FM clause to cancel the contract. So we have various ways of dealing with the concept of force majeure around the globe. And today we hear about what we see under English law contracts. And Felix uh, will mention the Swiss perspective, some um, areas of civil law imply force majeure as a um, term in a contract. Under English law, we cannot do this. Uh, there is no precise definition of um, force majeure. It's regarded purely as a creature of contract. And case is there to give the framework. So traditionally, um, we had uh, acts of God, such as hurricanes, flood and volcanic eruptions being in, included in, um, in, in force majeure clauses. And nowadays we see increasingly more elaborate force majeure clauses, which also deal with um, other aspects such as cyber attacks, diseases, sanctions, piracy. So as the world faces new disruptive events, we have more and more elaborate clauses trying to deal with those events. I mean, that's certainly what we saw with the various COVID clauses that have arisen um, through shipping and trading um, in, the, in, in recent years, and now the sanctions clauses, which try to address uh, an issue which, uh, which the market is facing. Um, I think that's as much as I want to say to set the scene as a teaser, and I will now pass 
the um, button over to, to Richard Kegwin, who's going to give us a focus on the oil trading side and also share his shipping experience and charter party to, and give us, give us an insight on how, how it works from his perspective. Good evening, everybody. So I'm Richard Kegwin. Uh, I, I'm an in-house lawyer with uh, Total Energies. Uh, we have our trading and shipping business based here in Geneva. And uh, um, I've been here for about um, 15 years. Having said all of that, everything I say tonight is my own view. Uh, and so don't blame Total Energies if I say something with which you strongly disagree. And uh, I found in preparing this that I had to be quite careful to consider questions about confidentiality. And also, I was a little bit reluctant to talk about my dirty laundry in public. And, and, and then I saw some of the other slides, and I saw that there are at least two total cases uh, being discussed tonight. And, and after that, there's a, another case that uh, I did when I was working in London, uh, which ended up in the Court of Appeal too. So uh, I'm blushing already. Um, I think the main reason I agreed to talk tonight was because uh, um, uh, I was very flattered uh, to be involved in something young. Uh, but, but beyond that, uh, I'm uh, recruiting at the moment. So I wanted for one minute to talk about Total Energies <laughs> and say uh, that um, uh, you know, we're a big company, fully integrated on Asia, uh, and uh, the trading and shipping business is based here in Geneva. We now have about a thousand people based here in Geneva. Uh, and we're trading crude, we're trading all the products, LPG, LNG, Big growing business is uh, electricity as well. So if anybody's interesting uh, or interested, you'll find uh, if you look carefully on LinkedIn, you'll, you'll find the uh, job application. Right? How do I move the slides on? And Geneva is a great place to work. Bon. Oh, okay. <laughs> so uh, I wanted to start um, by talking about the, uh, the the oil and gas context. Uh, very quickly, in case you don't know this already, uh, there, there are a number of oil majors, I'm sure you've heard of them all, uh, Exxon and Chevron from the United States and from Europe, you have Shell, uh, BP and uh, Total Energies. After that, there's a number of other big companies uh, as well, who you might well consider to be uh, an oil major as well. Then you have a different uh, uh, category of, of uh, companies in, in, in this sector. Uh, what you would call a national oil company. The best example of that is Aramco from Saudi Arabia, uh, but uh, it's not the only one. Uh, Adnoc is another example too. They are very important in the oil trade. Then you have another category of, uh, of player in this business, if I may, the, the, the trading companies. So these two will be probably very well known to everybody on this call, uh, um, people like Traffic Euro and Vitol and Glencore, and there's a host of other companies after them, and, and some are very, very big uh, and uh, have uh, integrated a bit into assets, you know, upstream assets or downstream assets, uh, and, and some have not. Uh, then, how do we uh, buy and sell? Uh, 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 oil and gas. Uh, typically, it's done by sea. It can be done by pipeline or by rail, but mostly today we're going to talk about trading by sea. <clears throat> uh, there are some, some standard form contracts that are quite well known. We have uh, Total GTCs, BP have a well-known set too, as, as do uh, most of the other oil majors. It's uh, typical to base a contract on, on an INCO term. And uh, another characteristic that uh, is pretty typical is that it's usually the seller who prepares the uh, contract. So very often you'll find you're contracting on, on seller's terms. English law is, is dominant. Uh, I think Exxon sometimes use American law and, and there'll be some local law contracts as well, but usually, very often it's, it's English law. The shipping side, uh, often often tankers are not owned by the oil majors, but most of the oil majors like to have a controlled fleet of time charters or even bare boat charters. And, and there's a lot of voyage chartering, so but, but shipping can be slightly separate. 
then after that, uh, what, what are the main standard form contracts to mention? Uh, you've got contracts like um, Shell Time, Shell Voy, BP Voy, Tank Voy on the chartering side, and, and uh, I've mentioned the uh, trading contracts already. As Michael said, in recent years, there's been a lot of volatility and instability. What this generally leads to is, is uh, oil majors and, and uh, other traders introducing clauses into their uh, trading contracts to, to address these. So we have seen in recent years that most contracts now include a sanctions clause following you know, problems we've seen in Iran, Russia, and Venezuela. Uh, there's been a war clause for a long time in these contracts, but you also now see uh, clauses addressing health following uh, problems like Ebola and uh, COVID more recently, and, and of course, piracy clauses. More to, to uh, um, force majeure. In charter parties, it's fairly unusual to have a, a force majeure clause, particularly in a voyage charter. Instead, you find yourself looking at the exceptions clause commonly, or, uh, and, and maybe the provisions of the demarriage contract, but you shouldn't forget as well that the, the common law uh, uh, concepts like um, frustration and, and illegality. Time charters, uh, pretty similar. Uh, it's still uh, in the oil and gas trade, pretty unusual to have a, a force majeure, sorry, in the oil side, it's pretty unusual to have a force majeure clause. Uh, and instead you'll be looking at things like uh, uh, the off-hire clause and, and the exceptions clause. Uh, again, um, frustration, illegality is important. <clears throat> Uh, but there are some time charter parties that will have um, have a, a, a force majeure clause, especially in, for example, the offshore industry or uh, in the LNG industry. And then very briefly, uh, contracts of a freightment uh, might well have a force majeure clause um, and, and uh, might even in some very unusual circumstances have a, a clause that, that uh, looks at... Uh, financial circumstances, uh, what, what I would call a hardship clause. Right, so I turn to frustration. No, I don't, I turn to force, more, force majeure. Uh, force majeure is a creature of contract and, and its functioning will depend uh, pretty much on entirely on what is agreed in the contract. And the party relying on uh, force majeure uh, must prove that the event that has been that has happened is identified in the clause. Uh, he'll have to prove that that has uh, prevented or hindered or whatever the clause says uh, him from performing the contract. Uh, he'll usually have to prove that, uh, that the non-performance was beyond his control, and, and he'll usually have to prove that there were no reasonable steps that could have been taken to mitigate the event or its circumstances. Sometimes you see a, a force majeure that goes a little bit further and says something like the event must be uh, unforeseeable, but, but uh, in, in oil and gas, that's a little bit less common. But, um, we'll going to next. Right, so um, the types of force majeure clauses that we see in the oil trading uh, uh, business. I would say these clauses are bookended by um, at one end a clause like the total clause, which I have put up on the screen, which is um, perhaps a more one-sided clause, you could say, uh, and uh, a clause like um, the the BP clause in, in their GTCs at uh, clause 65, which is a uh, more mutual clause. So I've put up the, uh, the, the uh, Total Fog Crude uh, Force Majeure Clause, and, and you can see that it opens with a uh, uh, what looks like a mutual start, and it does work mutually. It is, it is mutual in, in part one. But then in part two, uh, we get into a list of uh, um, Force Majeure events which uh, apply uh, to the seller, and it's important that that list will not apply regarding payment. N nobody in the oil um, and gas business is going to allow force majeure for paying. <laughs> then uh, the second characteristic I would 
second characteristic I, I would probably uh, identify is uh, the process of force majeure. Usually you have to give prompt written notice uh, and uh, in that you'll have to show the facts to, to, to fit the force majeure. You'll have to give a time estimate and uh, thereafter you should probably give updates as well. And the next point that's worth talking about, point three, uh, in, in, in looking at the oral uh, force majeure clauses is that some clauses, like the total clause, gives a very wide discretion to the seller uh, about performance, whether he should buy an alternative car game. Uh, by contrast, the, uh, the BP clause talks about uh, the party relying upon the clause to, to use reasonable endeavours to mitigate. So it's... Uh, it, it's um, a much more balanced approach, I suppose you could say. But I, I would add that uh, Chevron, Shell and Exxon are very much more in line with Total on that point. Uh, then after that, um, what, what are the, uh, the, the consequences of, of force majeure? If you were to read the BP, Shell and Chevron clauses, it looks like the same person drafted them because they start off by saying if, if, a, if performance becomes impossible, then, then uh, you know the, the, the contract ends immediately, which looks a lot like frustration to me. But the the real key point I wanted to focus on is that in our clause, um, there's a sort of thirty day period, uh, which I, I've highlighted there on the screen, uh, before cancellation will uh, be an option for either party. Whereas in some of the other clauses, like BP, Shell, and Chevron, uh, the period is much shorter. Uh, for example, it could be near the, the, a link to the uh, delay cap or, or delivery dates. Um, in all the force majeure clauses in the oil industry, uh, the seller is not obliged to purchase or alternative um, cargoes. And in most, um, the, the force majeure event does not need to be unforeseeable, although there's one or two exceptions. For example, in the first example I wanted to talk about, the, the terminal problem case, uh, one, one of the uh, trading companies, the Chinese company QC, uh, ha had a requirement of unforeseeability. So going very quickly through uh, the examples I put on my list, there are many examples, I just picked out some that were interesting. Crude Sky, uh, that concerns a, a, um, an oil terminal in Nigeria, which is operated by Total. Uh, and uh, one of the equity interests was a company called QC, who sold on FOB terms to uh, one of the VTOL companies called VTOL Asia, who sold to their affiliate VTOL SA, SA, who sold on, on FOB terms to Traffic Euro. And Traffic Euro had uh, chartered a tanker from a company called Great Elephant. What happened is this. In Nigeria, uh, before you can load a ship, uh, a tanker, a terminal, you need to have approval from the Department of Petroleum Resources. Usually, there's a man from Port Harcourt who comes onto the terminal and says, yes, that's fine, and unlocks the padlock. On this occasion, the man from Port Harcourt had left the, uh, the, the terminal, and um, uh, so, so Total's man gave him a call. Yes, fine, go ahead, uh, you, you can load. But unfortunately, this is the wrong procedure, and or at least according to the authorities, it's the wrong procedure. And, and uh, we should have had the authority from a man in Lagos rather than the man in Port Harcourt. Originally, the man in Lagos had, had uh, uh, well, so he did give authority, but then subsequently uh, uh, revoked it. Long story short, Total started loading, having used some bolt cutters to cut the padlock, and, and then guess what? The ship got detained. Uh, Total had to pay $12 million to have the ship released, and uh, the claim that ended up in court was uh, essentially the demurrage claim from ship owners against Traffic Europe. The case went through the commercial court, derived in the Court of Appeal, and uh, the Court of Appeal said, this is not force majeure. Uh, and so owner's claim for its demurrage succeeded in full. And what the Court of Appeal said was, you cannot rely on force majeure where the delegated responsibility to a third party, which was uh, uh, Total here, uh, is a, uh, or where you have delegated 
responsibility to a third party for contractual responsibility. So Traffic Era couldn't, but Traffic Era had essentially done that here by, by delegating some contractual responsibility to Total. So the event was not beyond the control, uh, the court said, of, of Total, and consequently no force majeure. Um, and, and just an interesting little side note here as well, um, uh, for, that there was no unforeseeability requirement in, in most of the trading contracts, but there was in the CUSI uh, uh, um, trading terms. Uh, uh, probably the takeaway is don't go to court relying on, on facts where you have used bolt cutters. Uh, the next point I wanted to mention very quickly concerned disease. I, I put up two cases, both of which uh, uh, involve uh, COVID. In the first case, um, it's a, a ship sale and purchase. Uh, Bart was selling a ship to NKD, uh, which was going to be scrapped. Along comes COVID. The, the MOA uh, includes a clause talking about restraint of government. And, and because of the uh, the, the government rules uh, as a result of COVID in, in the place where the ship was due to be delivered. Uh, the seller couldn't get the ship to the delivery place. Once again, the court says, no, you, this is not force majeure uh, because you didn't have to uh, deliver to transfer title. So another case where there's no force majeure. Uh, the other, the Dwyer case, uh, there was force majeure in, in uh, a similar COVID situation, well, not similar, it's, it's all about a, a plumbing franchise, but in that case, force majeure was, it was considered as force majeure. Well, uh, the next examples I was going to run through very quickly concern sanctions. Um, the first case I've put up uh, concerns uh, a contract of refreshment which Del Monte had for importing fruit into Iran. They were uh, roughly halfway through uh, COA and, and uh, then said they couldn't perform because of the uh, uh, sanctions on Iran result in court. Yes, Del Monte are absolutely right. So they, they did uh, succeed there. Um, uh, Moor ship, shipping, I think, is going to be spoken about by somebody else. So I won't say very much about that. I'm sure she's very relieved, yes. relieved to hear that. <laughs> uh, and, and very quickly, perhaps I should mention my own experience uh, in, in the last year or so uh, of uh, sanctions and force majeure. Like um, quite a lot of companies, uh, and probably quite a lot of people who listen to this call, uh, we at Total Energies had um, some time charter parties with Russian ship owners. Uh, and uh, our experience was that at the very beginning of the war in Ukraine, um, the force majeure clauses did not bite, sanction clauses didn't bite. That's not entirely surprising because uh, uh, there was a winding down period. And, and you remember that the sanctions sort of built up over a period of time. Uh, so after uh, several weeks, in fact, I found that my clauses were not particularly good. <laughs> and and uh, in fact, it was frustration that, that uh, ultimately brought the contracts to an end. Uh, and and, and um, mule shipping is interesting because uh, there, there was a point where you couldn't pay in the United States dollars. And the question was, should we uh, you know, be paying higher in, uh, in a different currency? And, and, and I'm sure everybody, not just uh, people like me were looking at the question, is this evasion or is this a reasonable step to mitigate, which is exactly what shipping is, is uh, all about, I would say. Um, bon. there, um, there are many other examples of uh, force majeure. Um, Acts of God is, is perhaps the most obvious one. In my world, that often means hurricanes in Texas. Uh, that usually means that there is force majeure in the trading contracts, but uh, probably not in, in the voyage charter parties. So I'm, I'm reaching my last point, which was really the whole uh, subject of today's debate uh, re regarding price volatility. I would say it's exceptionally rare for um, uh, price volatility to, to amount to force majeure in, in the oil industry, certainly. 
Uh, what I have very occasionally seen is, is uh, in, in um, contracts of a freight matter, for example, something like a hardship clause, whereby, um, for example, a big charterer might uh, have uh, some sympathy with a, a slightly smaller ship owner uh, and a clause saying that if, if uh, the market is moved, or for example, the bunker price is moved very, very significantly, then the parties can uh, talk. It's it's more of an agreement to agree rather than a uh, uh, force majeure provision, but it's perhaps a relation of, of force majeure. The one example I could think of in the oil, of, oil and gas industry where um, you might have price volatility uh, amounting to uh, force majeure was in the context of uh, sale and purchase agreements for LNG, where um, you might have a clause uh, called a price reopener in a very, very long term contract. It might be a 10 years contract, 20 years contract. And, and uh, this gives the parties the ability to, uh, to not perform or underperform. It's very rare you see reports of these cases because they almost always go to arbitration. And they don't happen very often. But as we saw recently, there have been some very big swings in price of, of LNG. And, and so it can be enormously tempting to try to uh, not perform the, the, uh, the contract you have and, and to sell your product elsewhere uh, at, at uh, the market price. Um, this uh, uh, may, uh, in, in some of these contracts, you may well find that there's a liquidated damages provision, uh, a bit like demurrage, providing for compensation to your original buyer at, at uh, a much lower price. Uh, in some of these contracts, you might find that there is an exclusion for willful misconduct. Uh, and and uh, so, so is this willful misconduct? Uh, you, you can ask yourself that question. Or indeed, you might look at... Um, uh, uh, questions of duress and economic duress. So I, I understand that some companies do this, uh, and um, uh, I mean, one can ask the question to yourself: where, where your reputation is important, you know, does money have a memory? Voila! That's all I have to say on uh, first measure in the oil industry. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, Richard. And without further ado, we've gone from the oil industry straight into the grain business. Mark and Kelly look at um, force majeure and a very different clause, um, which is widely used in the market uh, under the GAFTA terms, which I think uh, appear the most GAFTA contracts. So, uh, I do over to you, Martin. Uh, thank you, Michael, and thank you, Francesca, for the uh, very kind introduction earlier, and uh, welcome to everyone uh, listening online. Um, so, um, Everyone's well aware of the two major events we've had in the world this year. Um, uh, well, this year, this year and last year, the, the uh, Russia-Ukraine war and um, uh, more recent, uh, in recent times, the pandemic as well. Now, um, lawyers have always been looking at force majeure clauses, but in more recent times, I think, I think we've been looking at them even more. Um, We've also seen uh, some recent cases. So if you haven't looked at the force majeure clauses in your contracts um, uh, in recent years, then I, I'd be very surprised. And, and if you haven't, I'd uh, probably recommend that you, that you do so now. Um, I'm going to focus on some practical issues in commodity contracts uh, with some particular emphasis on the grains industry. And uh, we'll also look at the, uh, the GAFTA FM clause uh, as we go through the slides. So um, imagine this, it's, it's, it's 5.30 on a Friday afternoon and the ops manager comes to your uh, desk and, and, and says, the, uh, the, the, the seller's declared force majeure. Um, what do we do? So, so the first thing you, you say is, well, let's, let's have a look at the notice. Give me the notice, what's happened? Then you, then you say, give me the contract. I want to look at the contract. Uh, you look at the force majeure clause. You see whether the, uh, the event comes within uh, the definition of a force majeure event. But um, it's also important, uh, I, I would say as well, to look at the scope of the contract because 
Um, while an event might come within the definition uh, of, of an FM event, um, your contract and, and the obligations uh, of a seller under a contract could be much wider than the limited effect of a force majeure event in one particular place or a country. So, for example, the origin of the goods um, uh, may be a number of different countries, but the FM event may just affect one country. Um, your contract may have optional origin, origins. Consider uh, in whose option uh, 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 that is, uh, because um, if you have uh, this kind of option, then you know you may one party or the other may still be bound um, to to perform the contract despite the force majeure event. I would say it, in general, if a contract provides for a range of origins, it's unlikely the FM event will prevent performance. Um, another thing to consider is if you're if you're buying or if you're selling CNF, um, this a CNF contract is a contract selling documents. Um, so while a force majeure event may prevent uh, goods from leaving a country that you may have intended to put onto a ship, um, a seller is also obliged uh, to, um, to provide the documents, to provide a bill of lading within the shipment date. And they can still do that, even if uh, they're prevented perhaps from shipping the goods they may still be able to buy the goods afloat uh, and, and sell the documents. So that's a, a, another issue to consider. Um, so, so you've looked at all those issues and that, now it's 6.30 on a, on a Friday evening and, and you decide, well, I need, I need some proper legal backup. So I'm gonna call Michael at HFW uh, <laughs> to give me some advice. Michael looks through all the issues you've, you've, you've looked at previously. Um, and he, 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 then he asks you, you know, what's happening in the markets? Uh, what's happened uh, to, to in the markets for the goods and, and freight? Have there been big price movements? And you're thinking to yourself, I call Michael for some legal advice. Um, why, why is he asking me about what's going on in the market? And it's, it's a very important issue that, um, because you need to put into context why perhaps one party has put you on notice because quite often there have been movements in the market which may be related to the FN event but they might completely be um, disconnected and it's important context because if the party is perhaps motivated because of the movements in the market then that puts you on notice and probably um, uh, encourages you or motivates you to ask for proper evidence of, of whether this FN event has prevented a party from, from really performing the contract. Um, looking at the GAFTA clause, um, these are the first two paragraphs in the GAFTA clause. Um, I, I'll just highlight um, uh, a, a few points. First, first uh, thing I would highlight is there's no event for failure of suppliers or intended suppliers, which sometimes you see in the, in the oil industry. You, you don't see that in in, in the grains industry. Also, um, at the end of the first paragraph, you have this term, any other event comprehended in the term force majeure. Um, for me, that's, that's pretty uh, worthless words at the end of, the, of, of that paragraph because it's going to be uh, interpreted quite restrictively and, and it doesn't really add much to what goes before. Um, and another point to note uh, that there are no express terms uh, uh, obliging a party to exercise reasonable endeavors to overcome the FM event. I'll come back to this a bit later because perhaps that, that, that could be implied um, when, when the clause is interpreted. The next uh, issue to note is if you look in the second paragraph, should seller's performance of this contract be prevented, whether partially or otherwise, by an event of force majeure, the performance of this contract shall be suspended. 
Um, so, so the point to note here is this clause is for the benefit of the sellers. It's not, it's not mutual. Right. It's just, it's just the seller. Um, and the last point in the second paragraph, uh, there are notice provisions. Um, as, as with all commercial terms in a commercial contract like this, um, make sure you comply with the notice provisions because if you don't, it's quite likely they're going to be conditions uh, to reliance on the on the FM uh, clause. Um, moving on, a, a point I think um, Richard made uh, also about foreseeability. Um, this was an issue that came up um, during the pandemic, but also more recently during the U Ukraine uh, Russia war. Is is that um, in general? There's no requirement that an FM event must be unforeseeable, even if it is already occurring at the time you enter into the contract. It's still quite possible that the party might be able to rely on that. Um, uh, and specifically in the grains industry, the, there's no provision in a, in, in a GAFTA contract um, in the FM clause to uh, uh, making express reference to the pandemic. Um, so parties were attempting to rely on an act of God, um, but uh, people may know that an act of God is generally an, an unforeseeable event, something which um, could not have been anticipated. So f following this, um, many parties in the industry did um, include uh, additional words in their in their clauses to ensure that whether uh, foreseeable or unforeseeable, uh, such events uh, may still be relied on. Uh, and I think that's something uh, th something to be aware of. Um, just moving on now to uh, the remainder of the GAFTA FM clause. Um, this this really shows the um, the effect of an FM event. So um, basically, the first paragraph says, if the event continues for twenty one days from the end of the shipment period, then um, a buyer has the option to cancel by serving a notice on the seller. Um, that option has to be exercised in a very sh uh, short time frame. Then going to the second uh, paragraph, if the, if the buyer doesn't exercise, the contract continues for another 14 days uh, and um, is automatically canceled if the force majeure event has not ceased uh, by the end of that period. Um, the uh, third paragraph uh, deals with a situation where the force majeure event has ceased. So, if if it does see uh, if it does end um, before any optional cancellation or automatic cancellation, then the contract comes alive again. It's no longer suspended, and the seller has the period, um, the, the remainder of the shipment period that was open to it when the force majeure force majeure event occurred um, to um, uh, perform under the contract with with a minimum of 14 days. I think the last point to mention is, is about burden of proof. This clause in, in the GAFTA uh, provision uh, doesn't say anything more than is required under, uh, uh, under uh, law, is, is that the party relying on the clause uh, has the burden of proof. Um, a couple of more points I'd like to make before I hand over. Um, uh, this point about reasonable endeavours to overcome or, or to mitigate a uh, force majeure event. Now, um, there are no express words like this in a, in a grains uh, sale and purchase contract, certainly not in a GAFTA contract. You don't usually see that in contracts in the grains industry, but it's, it's quite common in, in um, other sale and purchase contracts. It's, 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 it's common in many general commercial contracts. Um, but e even if you don't have this clause, I, I would uh, stress to exercise a, a caution because um, there can be a duty to mitigate and avoid the effects of an FM event. 
So in effect, it could be implied. And, the, and there's a case called Channel Island Ferries, which, which looks at this. Um, in, in GAFTA uh, situations, um, this is generally considered in relation to the interpretation of whether an event actually prevented performance. So could a seller have performed the contract within the bounds of its contractual obligations? Um, an example um, might be, um, could a set, despite uh, not being able to get the goods within a country, um, could a, a seller have bought the goods afloat? So could a CNF seller have bought the goods afloat? Perhaps if there has been an export ban, um, uh, the, an, a, a seller would um, have to, um, let's say, exercise endeavors to obtain a license, to ob obtain uh, a quota if, if, uh, if there has been a quota granted by a particular country. So uh, to summarize this point, the, the recent Muir decision shouldn't really affect the GAFTA FM clause or its interpretation, unless the parties have expressly included uh, uh, an obligation to exercise reasonable endeavors to overcome the FM event. Uh, and lastly, um, uh, this is related to the Muir decision. I just want to talk about um, uh, the, you know, whether you should include a sanctions event within force majeure or whether you should have a standalone sanctions clause. Um, if you do include a sanctions event uh, within your FM clause, and the FM clause uh, has an obligation on the affected party to exercise reasonable endeavors to overcome, then um, it could require uh, a party to, um, uh, to, to, to perform a contract outside of the contractual terms in order to overcome the sanctions event. So as we saw in the Muir decision, uh, one of the parties was required uh, or, or was a, would have been obliged to um, accept funds in a different currency to what was set out in the contract. Um, I, would, I would say just consider whether it's in your interest to have a sanctions event within a, a force majeure clause, because when you're dealing with sanctions, it's not only legal, but reputational issues at stake. Um, you have many different parties within the contractual nexus, you'll have banks, you'll have insurers, and each party has a different um, risk appetite for sanctions. Many parties will have sanctions policies which are more onerous um, than uh, the, the law requires. Uh, so I, I would say it's probably better to have a standalone sanctions clause dealing with specific issues that can arise on sanctions because you, I think you need the, the flexibility and you don't want the rigid uh, terms of a force majeure clause, which, which um, may automatically um, terminate your contract. Um, so th those are a few sort of practical points which I wanted to, to mention. And I'll now hand over to Michael to discuss some of the uh, more detailed legal issues. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martin. I'd be very, very short indeed, because I think we are we are um, running out of time quickly, but I just wanted to bounce off uh, on two points which Martin raised and which, which really um, struck a chord with me, because when we had this idea about poker FM, powerful tool in a volatile market, um, indeed, we'd seen in the last year a number of um, FM situations arising in the same circumstances and parties arguing the GAFTA clause, which Martin just referred to, either way. And uh, sometimes we have the same arbitrators on various panels uh, for different clients. And um, we can't emphasize enough how important it is to keep your cards close to your chest and not to, um, not to advise, I think if it's, a call received at 7.30 from Martin on a Friday afternoon, after Friday evening, I'd probably be in a restaurant with about a half and looking at the FM issue and thinking, hey, is a, has the market moved indeed? 
and it's probably eight or nine o'clock now in the evening, and I'd be thinking, if the market has moved, then the best thing to do is not to terminate and just to follow the clause, which in the GAFTA context is 21 days. So you just accept that FM has been declared, and you have 21 days to look at the factual evidence. And we had one case, for example, where the sellers had declared FM, and on the next day, the brokers were actually um, making the cargo available to other buyers. So we were able to gather the information and then to terminate um, after the 21 days had lapsed and uh, call the bluff, so to speak, and say, um, this cargo, you weren't prevented or hindered or partially prevented from performing because we know the, market, the, the same cargo was available in the market. And the other way around, the GAFTA clause is quite interesting because it doesn't speak about full prevention, it speaks about partial prevention. So if a party is having its supply chain cut or has to buy a float, um, it's a partial prevention arguably, which allows the party to have 21 days to organize its affairs. So if the counterparty jumps the gun and terminates saying, well, it's a repudiation, you, have, you could have supplied in that given port uh, with a cargo coming from other origins because it wasn't just one origin uh, one country origin but various origins you still have to deliver at that port and if that port had logistical issues and it was fair to declare force majeure to give 21 days at least to overcome the partial um prevention so those are all issues which 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 uh require rapid thought but you don't need to take an action under the contract necessarily on the day you can um think about it and again make sure that what is happening on the ground matches with, uh, with the sanctions clause and um, what is being alleged or what you're alleging on your end so i won't i won't be very long at all i just wanted to have um i have a few slides just on the takeaway points i don't think i need to go back on i think everybody has taken away by now that english law um, does not uh, have force measure as a uh, as a state of the art. Uh, it, it, it's only what the clause says, and a clause which just refers to force measure uh, to apply um, would be void for uncertainty. And um, if the parties wish to have the benefit of the force measure clause, then an event should be specifically set out. So, for example, if you want industrial action to be part of your force measure event. Then you better state so in your clause otherwise an ingenious uh, buyer on the other end may argue that uh, industrial action is not covered because you could have overcome that event by um, increasing your workforce or salary for example um i am going to skip through um this slide although um yeah i wanted to, to briefly speak about war um, which is uh, a topical issue at the moment. The GAFTA clause uh, refers to hostilities and not to war. Um, a case um, for the Northern Pioneer gave a, or tried to give a definition of war, so it's uh, not uh, a technical uh, meaning, it's construed in a common sense uh, environment. So war in that case um, was, um, was described as something which is a war between two nation states, so in that case, a German participation, participation in military operations in Kosovo as part of NATO um, exercises was not a war involving Germany, for example. Um, and uh, just having a state declaring war is not necessarily um, uh, a trigger point either if the common sense approach uh, means that war is probably waged between the two countries. As much as I need to say about that, I'm conscious about time. Sanctions is, uh, of course, another hot topic. Uh, as Richard and Martin alluded to earlier, um, you probably have other ways in your contract um, to, um, to, 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 to set aside uh, the, the, the performance. You don't need to necessarily re rely on FM most charter parties would have um, some um, specific sanctions or prohibition clauses, um, i.e. NYPE 2015, for example. And of course, timing will be very key. So most sanctions imposed against Russia were 
um, imposed last year. So if you enter into a contract today, um, it will be very far-fetched to say, well, I, and I'm now prevented from performing because of a sanctions regime which was imposed a year ago. The timing would be also an issue. And um, the gas tax clauses are interesting, again, because um, as we've seen with Martin, um, there is a, a, an event which refers to action by any government, which could be seen as a force majeure event. Um, action by any government is a government imposing a sanctions regime. Um, now, it is possible, but it's more likely that um, you will be able to, 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 to uh, relieve, be relieved from performance under other doctrines under English law, um, illegality or frustration, for example. And you've got the example here of the Greek fighter, which is quite interesting, where you had um, a cargo which was um, loading uh, and discharging goods, uh, oil from Iraq, uh, which was at the time in breach of UN sanctions, which would have exposed the ship to arrest, and that uh, was a breach um, of a clause in the shared time for uh, form, which um, prevented goods or cargoes to be loaded on board the ship, which exposed the vessel to capture or seizure. Very briefly, because it is also the topic of today's um, discussion, what about economic issues collapse in the market? So you can try and make the most of your FM clause if you have an event which is triggered, but an event uh, which is market collapsed or uh, interest rates rising or freight rates rising is in itself not going to be seen as a force majeure event. Um, even though um, you have some clauses which refer to any other event, as Martin just explained to us, if you have just a, a fallback provision at the back of a list of events, it will be interpreted uh, restrictively and under a just um, generous principle. And um, the tangent aviation holdings case is quite interesting because uh, that was very clearly made. Uh, held that a purchaser's inability to pay due to credit market conditions was not um, a force majeure event, even though in that case the clause went as far as saying any cause beyond the seller's reasonable control, and market conditions are beyond the reasonable control, but it is going to be interpreted very restrictively, so this does not work. Um, and here is a list of other cases, uh, which you can read in your own time when you see the slides, which also um, make it very difficult uh, for market movements or um, any uh, depreciation in currency or abnormal rise of price in the, the market to, um, to be um, considered as a force majeure um, event. Some cases um, appear to leave the door open, however, I mean, you've got national carriers and Brower Co, but it's likely that only the most extreme cases could give rise to an arguable case of force majeure based on the change of um, economic circumstances. Um, to finish off on the English uh, side of the law and how uh, the English courts are interpreting those um, force majeure um, clauses and cases, uh, one case has um, been really quite interesting in the, in the last year, and that's the Mer Mer shipping case, which um, Amos is going to talk about very briefly. So I'll pass over the the computer to, to them off. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. I apologize already for those that were that attended our case updates where I or, already talked about the mirror shipping case. Um, I'm gonna go through it very quickly because we're running out of time. Um, basically, it's a bit of a, a strange one, this one, because the court found that uh, a party had basically to accept non-contractual performance uh, because that would have permitted to overcome an, uh, an event of force majeure. Uh, so the facts um, were, um, in summary, uh, that Muir and RTI concluded a, con a contract for a freightment for the carriage of um, bauxite from Guinea to Ukraine. And during the performance of the contract, sanctions were imposed by the US on the majority owner of RTI. Um, so Muir and immediately declared force measure saying that um, payments in USD, which were provided for under the contract, were prevented by sanctions 
and so the contract couldn't be performed. Uh, in response, RTI suggested that payments could be made in euros instead and um, offered to um, bear any expenses in that, respect, in that respect. But Muir refused to perform. So RTI had to bring a claim against Muir. Um, as you can imagine, it all turned on the force measure clause uh, and especially point D, which is in bold. Um, which means that an event of uh, an event or a state of affairs is considered a force majeure event only if it cannot be overcome by the reasonable endeavors of the affected party, with the consequences that if it can be overcome and the party hasn't exercised reasonable endeavors, it cannot rely on the force majeure events as a defense. Um, so it first came to arbitration and the tribunal found that as a matter of US law, the performance of the COA was not legally prevented by sanctions, but I it was highly probable that um, a US intermediary bank would first block the transfer on sanctions concern. However, they also found that Muir could have adopted the Euro uh, option with no detriment to them because RTI had um, undertook to, to bear any additional costs and therefore, they concluded that there was no force measure event because Muir could have overcome um, this with reasonable endeavors. They appealed that decision, <laughs> and the High Court, uh, considering the, the specific clause, found that the affected party was not required by the exercise of reasonable endeavors to accept non contractual performance in order to circumvent the effect of a force measure or similar clause. Uh, RTI in turn appeal and it went on to the Court of Appeal. And the Court of Appeal adopted a slightly different approach. Their reasoning was first to ask whether accepting the payment in euros would have overcome the state of affair resulting from the imposition of the sanctions on RTI's majority owner. And to answer that question, they considered whether the euro solution achieved the same result as contractual performance. And if it did, then it must be considered as overcoming the state of affairs. So the court explained that the underlying obligation in that case was for Muir to receive the right quantity of USD in its bank account at the right time. And therefore, the euro option immediately converted into USD upon receipt achieved that. And on top of that, um, the court also find that there was no disadvantage to Muir uh, in accepting that option as RTI would bear all expenses in that respect. So RTI's proposal would have overcome the force measure event and Muir could not rely uh, on it as a defense. So uh, a few reservation and take takeaways. Uh, first, the Court of Appeal made clear that this judgment was not generally applicable to other cases, but it was only concerned with this specific clause um, and not with reasonable endeavors obligation in general, nor force measure clauses in general. Um, they, of course, say that each force measure clause must, must be analyzed on their own um, wording and the, their own relevant facts. But the reality is that often force measure clauses contain reasonable endeavors obligation so that the decision might have a wider commercial significance than the court may thought. But in any event, the court also made clear that their findings wouldn't have been um, the same if accepting payments in euros would have resulted in a detriment to an euro or uh, in something different from what, they, what was required by the contract. So if it was something different than the right amount of USD in the right bank account at the right time. So say if the pay payment in euros um, would have resulted in some delay about uh, less than uh, with the USD payment, or if Muir had to bear the expenses of converting the currency, for example, the court may not have considered that the proposed change of currency uh, overcome the state of affairs. So despite what I said at the beginning, uh, I'm not sure it's right to say that the decision introduces uh, the possibility of parties having to accept non-contractual performance. Um, the court made clear that the real question was whether the party affected um, gets what it bargained for with no detriment. Uh, 
And if that's in fact the case, can we really talk about non-contractual performance? I wonder, and I, I'll leave you with that thought. <laughs> One, one question, the, at the time of the force major, the cargoes that NUR had put from uh, uh, Rousseau, were they, were they out of the money? Like, were they middle of the market? Is that, you know? I don't know. <laughs> He's a, he was employed very well. Uh, so that also <laughs> was, a, was a reason. Because but, I know, I know I mean, they don't have a good reputation for a reason. That might have been a, uh, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Because it has changed and twice this contract after the new mm -hmm. With the, uh, some, yeah, Northern and it's a very piece. Aqualusa and they were never really stopped because the price since the sanction, the price of books have went up so much that mm. the, the market then was not faced the uh, increasing price. Uh, but then you are, it's, it's even worse. But, <laughs> but they eventually resume performance of the contracts, but I thought you would decide that. Right. Yes, because the US introduced a, a license or a general exception, so they, they had no argument anymore. In fact, you could tell much if you see whether we have any questions from the audience participating online. You can only see it here. In the chat. Can we repeat the question? Yeah, I don't think we have any other questions from. Um, the audience online. So that's um, conscious of time. We we'll move on to the Swiss aspects now, and we can then open the floor to questions. So I encourage all of you to um, type your questions in to the um, to the screen so that I can then put them to the to the, to the panel. We can have a discussion afterwards if, if time allows on the various points that have been raised so far and the points which will be raised now in a moment by my colleague Felix. So I'll let Felix um, take over from now. Thank you, Michael. Good afternoon, good evening to all. So, um, sorry, I'm going to change the. Oh. Oh. <laughs> sorry, there's a. A big little glitch there. Oh, okay. so, this one. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, so, briefly speaking, in English, uh, Swiss, sorry, Swiss law, you don't have a codified rule on force majeure. However, the um, Swiss Supreme Court has come with, I think, a rather explicit definition for uh, force majeure, which is an unforeseeable and extraordinary event that occurs with violence and it cannot be resisted. Um, <clears throat> that having been said, and absent a codified rule, there is a force majeure default legal framework in Switzerland, which uh, follows a so-called doctrine of impossibility subsumed under Article 119, Paragraph 1 of the Swiss Code of Obligations, which is tempered by, and I'm sorry for the non-Latinists in the room, the principle of the clausula rebus sextantibus, which is developed by uh, Swiss case law, and uh, in layman terms, basically means that uh, the judge can intervene under certain conditions to uh, adapt the contract when facing force majeure. Um, <clears throat> sometimes some of the contracts on the Swiss law will include a provision, uh, the inclusion, sorry, of the CISJ's convention, which itself has its own force majeure rules, notably at Article 79. I won't go into these here because it's a subject in itself and uh, it's a bit off topic. Um, so in addition to this framework, you have to bear in mind that Swiss law, force majeure law, is molded to a certain extent by global events because it is refined, defined, and perfected by Swiss case law. Um, ultimately, and this is some reassurance for many uh, contractual parties uh, uh, choosing Swiss law, uh, Swiss contractual freedom does allow the parties to define, exclude, include force majeure events quite 
freely in their contracts. Um, <clears throat> so a couple of words on the general principles and consequences of force majeure in Switzerland. So basically, um, force majeure will be considered if the contract performance uh, is impossible due to external circumstances, and this is very important, it's beyond the debtor's control. And in this case, Swiss law will provide that the contractual obligation, and here I stress not the full agreement, um, can be extinguished. So the debtor's impossibility has to be objective. So that means that the debtor and or any third party cannot perform the contractual obligation in question. Now, of course, this uh, principle is somewhat refined if uh, the uh, obligation is a strictly personal one. So typically an artist delivering a uh, supposed to deliver a painting cannot perform because his arms had been chopped off, then obviously uh, he cannot be substituted by a third party. Um, <clears throat> if force majeure is recognized, that means that the debtor will no longer need to make payment. And in bilateral contracts specifically, the consideration that has already been provided must be reversed. Finally, regarding ongoing obligations, uh, the consequences that I mentioned will affect uh, the reciprocal obligations. So that means for your contract and your agreement that although those obligations may no longer be um, applicable, uh, the agreement in itself remains valid and in force uh, for the future. Uh, obviously, the impossibility has to be permanent um, or definitive. So what do you need if you want to invoke force majeure under Swiss law? So obviously a um, presence of a force majeure event, so quite straightforward. You have to demonstrate that the debtor's performance has become objectively impossible, um, that this impossibility is due to no fault of the debtor, uh, and that the impossibility occurs after the parties have entered into their agreement. Um, <clears throat> Fifth point, the impossibility, as I touched on earlier, must be long lasting and definitive. And finally, and this is a sometimes a difficult point to prove, you have to demonstrate the existence of an adequate causal nexus between the force majeure event and the impossibility or default in question, which uh, for, for evidentiary reasons is sometimes quite tough. Um, <clears throat> so what can you do if you want to apply Swiss law to a contract and you want to have some control on over force majeure outcomes. Well, fortunately, the Swiss legal framework of contractual freedom does allow parties to extend, limit, include quite uh, quite substantially um, force majeure legal scope of application. And this is, I think, of benefit to most uh, commercial parties in that one, uh, the force majeure clauses will generally supersede the legal uh, regulation or default regulations provided under Article 119 of the Swiss Code of Obligations. And two, it allows the party to think about what it is they want to put in their contracts and what ancillary consequences are to arise if a force majeure event um, occurs. And uh, a bit later on in the presentation, I'll give you a live case where this has been absolutely crucial. <clears throat> So there again, apologies to the non-Latinists in the room. Uh, Swiss uh, contractual commercial law is uh, subject to various Latinistic principles. So the default one is the pacta sunt servanda principle. Uh, simply, simply said, it's a principle whereby the contract has to be observed and the obligations fulfilled. Now, under certain circumstances, another principle, the famous clausula rebus substantibus principle, will allow a Swiss judge to um, adapt under certain, 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 sorry, certain circumstances uh, the contract. And this is a, a useful tool when the contract, for um, whatever reason, in the life of its performance becomes uh, either commercially um, useless or uh, would lead if the, the, the force majeure uh, argument were to be uh, kept uh, to, to unsatisfactory um, results. Um, I've listed here the four conditions that have to be met, uh, but you have to bear in mind that this is really a, an exception to the rule. Um, the judge will, of course, examine on a case-to-case -case basis uh, the uh, application of these conditions, and uh, in practice, um, they will not really want to deviate from the Bactesum Servante principle. 
Now we've uh, heard a lot about uh, English law, so I'll keep it uh, brief here, but there is obviously a huge difference between uh, the Swiss approach and the English approach, in that in the English approach, there's no extra um, extrajudicial contractual sorry, application of force majeure. So it must be included in a contract to be invoked. If you don't have a force majeure uh, clause, then obviously you cannot uh, invoke it. Um, and this follows the uh, doctrine of absolute contracts, where basically the English court, unlike a Swiss court, uh, will simply look at the contract and uh, enforce, as it were, the obligations contained therein. And that can be a problem if typically your contract becomes uneconomic or commercially impractical. Um, you will have understood that uh, English law does not prov provide for uh, similar uh, or equi directly equivalent uh, principle to the clausula one. Uh, the closest English equivalent is the so-called law doctrine of frustration, wh whereby uh, if an event makes performance of the contract uh, illegal or possible, the contract is deemed as being frustrated and can be set aside. But there again, I think this doctrine is applied quite strictly uh, within very uh, specific uh, circumstances and leads sometimes uh, to uh, an unfortunate outcome, which is determination of the entire contract and not the, um, shall we say, limited determination of specific obligations. <clears throat> so <clears throat> what uh, cases have been discussed recently by Swiss tribunals in relation to force majeure? So we've touched on uh, in this presentation on the war in Ukraine and COVID-19. Here we have a very recent uh, Swiss Supreme Court judgment that was uh, issued um, in January this year, which I think is quite interesting because um, it pertained to uh, sponsors, sponsorship agreements that were entered into with regard to specific sporting events. And due to COVID-19, those events were cancelled and they were not rescheduled. And so uh, the parties terminated the agreement and the party who had paid the, the sponsorship to the fees uh, claimed all the monies that it had already paid back. Uh, the defendant didn't want to pay, and so they went to court. And the lower courts decided, while examining uh, the contracts, that uh, on the basis of the force measure clauses that were quite detailed, and I haven't reproduced it here, uh, because there are <laughs> several pages of them, uh, that one, there was a force majeure clause that was valid. Two, it did encompass uh, pandemics. And so since the World Health Organization had labeled COVID-19 as a pandemic, uh, it was held, withheld that it was a force majeure event. And finally, there was ancillary dispositions within these clauses that effectively dealt with what to do when the force majeure event um, occurred. And the net result was the money had to be paid back. And so the lower court simply applied what was in the contract on the basis of the Pacta Sunt Servanda principle. Um, that decision was appealed before the Swiss Supreme Court, which basically uh, decided that the lower courts had done their job correctly, they'd interpreted the contract, and uh, they'd come to the correct conclusion. Um, and the judgment is also interesting because they went a little bit further. Because one of the arguments that the appellant parties brought up was that uh, the lower courts should not have applied the, the contract uh, clauses um, and that they failed to apply the default rules provided under Article 119, Paragraph 1 of the Swiss Code of Obligations. To which the Swiss Supreme Court said simply, well, one, we don't agree, the, the clauses were clear, and two, even if we'd applied the default rules, uh, we'd have arrived to exactly the same conclusion. Um, so this gives some insight um, as to how the Swiss courts deal with force majeure. And uh, of course, the importance of providing in your contract for force majeure events and how to deal with them. Um, the second event, obviously, the war in Ukraine, or conflict in Ukraine, uh, <laughs> Ukraine aggression, as uh, aggressions in Ukraine, uh, is um, an interesting, of course, and topical event. Um, there isn't, to my knowledge, any Swiss Supreme Court judgments that directly um, deal with this uh, fourth measure event yet. Um, I do know of this case of the Swiss Commodity Trading Fair Expo, which around the 24th of February 2022 suspended all its exports of various raw materials from uh, a southwest port in uh, Ukraine. 
and issued force majeure notices. Uh, the problem here is that uh, all these uh, agreements were subject to international arbitration clauses, and as yet uh, the awards, to my knowledge, have not been issued, and consequently challenges against those awards have not been brought before the Swiss Supreme Court. So we're going to have to wait a little longer, I think, to see what the Swiss Supreme Court will have to say with, re with regard to the war in Ukraine. Um, a couple of takeaway remarks. Uh, this is, of course, my own personal view on <laughs> the Swiss approach to force majeure. I think that it's uh, quite a difficult law to deal with force majeure because uh, the foreseeability of the outcome of a dispute is um, not guaranteed because one, uh, Swiss case, uh, so Swiss force majeure law is uh, refined by Swiss case law, so on a case by case basis. And two, the Swiss judge may apply this famous clausula principle, um, which makes foreseeability of outcome, as I said, quite difficult. This leads me to my second comment, which is that uh, when you <clears throat> when you consider, and I think it's a good idea to consider putting force majeure clauses in your uh, contract, you must bear in mind that uh, the force measure clauses negotiation, which was already critical in the past, will become, I think, even more critical in the future, especially when uh, determining uh, the allocation or the sharing of force measure event related risks. Um, finally, of course, I think we can all agree that we live in an extremely volatile world um, and that the contract negotiation phase of um, uh, of the contract agreements will become more and more difficult and complex, but at the same time, very much necessary. And my last point is with respect to English law. Um, although we have different approaches, the conclusion is the same, that if you want to avoid force majeure risks, you better have solid force majeure clauses. And on that, um, I thank you all for your attention and hand over the mic or computer back to Mark. <laughs> Thank you very much, Felix, for this really interesting uh, voyage into the mechanics of Swiss law and how the Swiss courts are looking at this. I wonder whether we have any questions uh, from the audience in London and further uh, afield, and I don't think there is anything, so I might um, wrap up um, with uh, a question perhaps to the panel of speakers we've had tonight. And again, thank you very much to Richard, Felix, and Martin, and Amos for this really interesting and diverse um, approach to what we are seeing um, at the moment in, in terms of force measure, and it's a very rapidly evolving environment. And, and one question I had is, is a question I grappled with at the time during lockdown, stuck at home, when uh, one of my shipping cases blew up and the other side was raising um, Act of God as a defense, saying, well, clearly the virus and the pandemic is an act of God. So I am accused uh, under my force majeure clause from performance. And I, want, and I don't think the courts have really taken a decision. I don't think the point was ever litigated, but the point they were raising was, well, it's like a volcano eruption. Um, it is an act of God. It is unforeseeable and um, unpredictable. And it, um, it it's a question uh, of, of a natural occurrence, a virus, to which I, mean, I looked up the definition again um, and how the courts are looking at act of God. And it is an unforeseeable event Cause without the agency of man. So there, there we had a debate. It was a violence, you know, caused by the agency of man. I mean, what happened in Wuhan? I mean, was it <laughs> that is an open question? And then even then, I mean, without the agency of man, the virus doesn't circulate. You, without mankind, you haven't got a virus. So arguably, so uh, the agency of man was involved, and therefore um. Uh, we don't have a, an act of God here because the act of God really doesn't have the agency of man involved at all. So that was a question. I don't think it was actually litigated by the courts, but it, I thought it was put an ingenious argument to raise. <laughs> um, so so that, I mean, that, that, that's one thing that perhaps as a takeaway is that uh, counterparties are pretty ingenious in um, when they're facing such a volatile market to come up with uh, 
with, with ways to turn the force majeure clauses uh, in various ways <laughs> to um, to avoid performance. I don't know if you had any other further comments from any other speakers, but otherwise um, we would like to thank everyone at um, the London Shipping Law Centre and the Young Maritime Professionals Group for hosting this event with us and for making um, it happen. Thank you very much to all our speakers, um, Amos, Richard, Felix and Martin. Thank you for being here also. We've got a whole room of attendees and we'll have a few drinks now to wrap up and carry on the discussion offline. But in the meantime, thank you very much to all of you who have dialed in from further afield. And we look forward to seeing you again um, for the next uh, webinar and perhaps here in Geneva um, when you next come and visit us. Thank you very much and have a lovely evening. Thank you very much.